front line, as it were, in Brexit. And as we all know, there's only about 50 days to go before the end of the transition period, and we are in uncharted waters. As yet, there's no deal, and there's some prospect of one, but by, by no means certain. So there is a possibility we're going to be leaving on World Trade Organization terms. The impact of Brexit on the NHS has been discussed over the last four years since the referendum in great detail. Um, but I think things have really changed in the last a few months. First of all, we've had COVID, which has been a tremendous distraction, obviously, for the NHS, has occupied much of its energies. Brexit has rather dropped off the agenda in, in some respects, both politically and I think within the NHS, as people have battled to fight the immediate enemy of the COVID virus. Um, it's resulted in a lot of money having to be put into the NHS, probably far, far more than the infamous £350 million pounds written on the bus. It's taken up a lot of energy. And longer term, it could pose difficulties for future investment in the NHS because the burden on the country as a whole is so massive that public spending may come un under increased scrutiny and pressure in the years to come. Secondly, we've seen in the last few days the election of Joe Biden as the president-elect in the, in, the uh, in the USA. That has implications for a US-UK trade deal, um, particularly in terms of what model is adopted in Northern Ireland and between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. He's indicated he won't accept a hard border with the UK that will have some repercussions, I think, for the health service in both Northern Ireland and the South of Ireland. But we've also seen the media turn against Mr. Trump and start calling out some of what he has said. And I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, development and could indeed have repercussions for the Brexit debate. We got a fascinating panel today. So what I'm going to ask people to, to do uh, is initially answer, uh, tell us where they think we are. We're poised on the edge of Brexit, but what do they think this will mean for the NHS? And if we could first of all go to Bernie, perhaps you could just introduce yourself bri briefly, Bernie, and give us some idea where you think we are on this. Yeah, very happy to do so, Alison. Um, well, just to give a wee bit of a context, um, I'm the, the Chief Officer of uh, Cooperation and Working Together. It's, it's known as COT, and it is, um, it's a voluntary partnership between uh, the health service in Northern Ireland, the Border County uh, Trusts in particular, the Western Trust and the Southern Trust, and the commissioners in Northern Ireland, the Health and Social Care Board, and the Public Health Agency, and then the six border counties of the Republic of Ireland, and that the Southern Health Service is known as the HSE, the Health Service Executive. And as I suppose just to say, for many years, since 1992, um, the, the two services have agreed to work together and um, I suppose engagements which um, you know people patients and clients particularly rely on I mean the island of Ireland is has just over 6.5 million people and it's separated by a border which stretch stretches for about 470 kilometers so on a daily basis our staff would cross the border to deliver services in the other jurisdiction and patients cross the border uh, to, to receive services in the opposite jurisdiction. And that is quite simply because um, the infrastructure is very poor. We have a, an aged population. Accessibility to services, unless you're in the main centres, is very poor. And the difficulty for us has always been to recruit and retain you know, high calibre staff. Um, so where we are now is... Uh, is, is unaffected at this point in time. Um, we have come a long, long way. When I started in the health service first, to just give an idea of, of how far we were away from where we are now, 
as a very young nurse at the time, um, I can remember traveling with a patient in the back of an ambulance down to the border and the ambulance from the other jurisdiction would have come across and actually we moved the patient from ambulance to ambulance. Now we have a situation where the ambulance services, for example, cross the border routinely every single day of the week and they bring the patient to the nearest um, appropriate hospital. So where we are now, um, I think, uh, we in a, in a situation where we don't know, because this was unprecedented, non-planned for we, the decision to end in the Republic of Ireland. So we're still trying to come to terms with, you know, what are the implications of Brexit? And because really they're largely unknown, there's been a huge amount of planning, but really I don't think we will know the, the extent of it until we're very, very clear, you know, what these deals mean. So the health services continue to work and we have many, many, um, I suppose, uh, SLAs, service level agreements, um, which, which depend on the combined population. For example, um, the radiotherapy centre, which is in Derry in Northern Ireland, which serves not only the Western Trust area of Northern Ireland, but also the, the indigenous population of Donegal. So if uh, we were unable to continue to work, that would compromise that. But I think I suppose if I had to say one thing, the main thing that I'm worried about it would be the emergency transfers. I mean, if we have elective surgery or elective services in one or other jurisdiction, well then back in the day, I can remember stopping at the border for a half an hour each time to cross it. You can legislate for that, but if we have to stop ambulances and, and other emergency vehicles, then I think it would be a very different situation. Thank you, Leila. That sounds a, a very concerning situation if you really don't know what is going to happen in 50 days time. Do you, do you think the population of Northern Ireland have realised that you're in this position? Well, there's been a degree, I suppose, Leila, of, um, of assurances given by, I suppose, both departments of health and that their intent is to continue to deliver services on either sides of the border. And I mean, we're in, right in the middle of a European structured fund, which has invested heavily in the border corridor. And there are many services equaling sort of over 30 million at the moment being delivered on either side of the border. So both exchequers have underwritten those programs. So the, the financial support is there. It's just the physical, um, I suppose, impediments that there may be in the future. Maybe not immediately, maybe not in 50 days time, but we still don't know. Um, there's just that assurance from one health, health service to another. We still want to do business together. It's still important that we do. And how has COVID affected this? Because you have had quite a severe outbreak in Northern Ireland, which I think is still going on at quite high levels. And that must be taking up a lot of bandwidth um, yeah. for, for yeah. managers. Yeah, it absolutely has. Um, strangely enough, uh, the cross-border cooperation has been you know, a real godsend in a situation. For example, in a very basic way, um, you, you'll see Letterkenny General Hospital in County Donegal sharing PPE with Alton Gelvin and vice versa. So that very pragmatic, practical thing has worked well. Staff across the border and many staff work in both jurisdictions. You know, for example, we have a vascular surgeon. We deliver services. He's, he is employed by the Western Trust, but delivers services in Letterkenny and Donegal. So that has remained in situ where elective surgery is available. Um, but, and I mean, obviously all of the theater and, and, and um, clinical sp spatial capacity is, you know, every day it changes, but where possible we've continued to, to support each other and to support the patients and clients in each area. But COVID's a huge challenge. I mean, the urgent has driven out the important really. Okay. Perhaps we could 
turn to Dr. Philippa Whitford. Um, obviously from, from Scotland, you don't have this issue of a land, land border in quite the same way, but I wondered how you felt the position was in, in, in Scotland at the moment. What, what will Brexit mean for the NHS there? Well, I mean, I've been working trying to get the NHS and health impacts of Brexit onto the agenda at Westminster since 2016. Um, and I think it really took an awful long time before the government began to realise the EU isn't just about, uh, you know, trade and business and customs. And I think there are kind of five major health impacts and they will be felt in all the component nations of the UK. I think the first one is workforce. You know, you're treated by people, not machines or buildings. And we've already had an almost 90% drop in EU nurses coming to the UK. And, you know, England on its own has 43,000 vacancies. Our vacancies, while considerably less, have increased. So workforce is a huge issue for both health and social care. And that's going to be an awful lot worse after Brexit. We have the issue of medicines, the immediate one in 50 days about getting medicines into the UK that we don't produce. The UK doesn't produce insulin. We don't produce radioisotopes. While you can store insulin if you've got enough free freezers and fridges, as Matt Hancock boasted, but you cannot store radioisotopes. So even if you have a contingency plan to bring them in, that will inevitably, both with bureaucracy and possibly flying in, medicines or radioisotopes, it will be more expensive. And therefore, for providing exactly the same service, the NHS is inevitably going to pay more for drugs, more for devices, more for PPE that it's importing. And that therefore will have a huge impact on, on what it can do. And then of course, we've left the EMA. So new medicines getting from the laboratory to the patient is, is going to be delayed because we're outside the EMA. We're losing reciprocal health care. You know, pensioners retire to the south coast of Spain where they've never paid tax because they have the right to transfer their health care rights. People who even need dialysis are able to go for a week to Italy and arrange their dialysis therapy. We're losing these things and nobody talked about that in the referendum. The fourth is research. The EU is the biggest single research network in the world bigger than America and bigger than China. And we're now going to be on the outside. And the last one is the kind of public health, um, you know, cleaner water, cleaner beaches, tackling pollution, maternity rights, workers' rights, health and safety. You know, we hear a lot from conservatives, oh, the EU is all about red tape. But one person's red tape is someone else's life or limb. And, and those are, the, to me, the five big kind of areas where we have gained health-wise, not just NHS, but health-wise, that we are going to lose. And, you know, particularly from, from drugs, what we've seen is, is a vast increase in drug shortages, even since the referendum. There were two big kind of surges, because the only way you can stockpile drugs is either by increasing production, which you may not be able to do, or by creaming a little bit off the top. And if you look back, you'll see that Instead of usually less than 20 uh, drugs being uh, listed as shortage, we were up between 80, 90, 100 on three occasions over the last couple of years. And of course, the government called on pharmaceutical companies to stockpile. But exactly as you were saying, Alison, with COVID, you know, the whole the production of everything across the world has been reduced. So it's not the same trying to stockpile these things now. So I think there's been a failure at government level to recognise what Brexit means for health and the NHS. And I think for all health services and indeed politicians, COVID is using up a lot of bandwidth. As Bernie said, you know, the, the urgent is overshadowing the important. And yet we are, you know, the, the kind of cliff edge is getting awfully big in the window. Thank you. I think the European Medicines Agency is a really interesting position because we were both members of it and hosted it in London. It's now moved to Amsterdam. We no longer have a seat at the table, but we have not yet set up any mechanism to completely replace it. So we, as I understand it, we're going to be taking EMA rules 
um, for the foreseeable future without having any say in what they are, which um, is something which perhaps is slightly oddly with the idea of taking back control. Well, the, the legislation for the MHRA to, to, to cover everything, I mean, the MR, MHRA played a big part in the EMA. They did a lot of the inquiries. They have a lot of expertise, but they did yes. about, you know, 30% of, of assessments. They are now having to expand up to do all of that. But so you, again, you're talking about duplication. You're talking about extra cost. And if you look... Um, Part of the reason that we got early access to new drugs was because the EU is such a huge market of 500 million people. If you look at Canada and Australia, they get access to new drugs six to 12 months later, sometimes even two or three years later, because we are calling on pharmaceutical firms to now go through a separate process for the UK for a market of 66 million as opposed to 450 million in the rest of Europe. And they may just, particularly how long it takes expensive new drugs to become standard in the NHS. You know, some of them are already saying, well, you know, we're not gonna rush because even if we get licensed in the UK, it always takes ages before you start using them. So we'll wait until the price has fallen. So the impact of that is the bureaucracy, but also the impact on people launching new drugs in the UK. Right. Thank you. Perhaps we could turn to Leila McKay now. Uh, this is obviously your, your, your meat and drink, as it were, uh, for, for your role at the NHS Confederation. But ha what's happened over the last six to, to eight months as COVID has suddenly come on the uh, agenda? Do you think that has changed things? I mean, it certainly has. As... Um someone who runs the NHS Confederation's European office and also the Secretariat for the Brexit Health Alliance. It has been quite a journey over the last four years, all the way from, you know, hearing about the concept of Brexit to analysing its impact for the NHS today, um, understanding what it would mean for the wider health sector and you know, the UK's place in Europe and beyond. And finally, you know, we're on the cusp of knowing what, what it will actually look like. Um, I guess the, the question of whether Brexit is good or bad or profitable or whatever for the NHS, those sorts of questions died a long time ago. And I guess that what we're really looking at now are the important questions of what's going to change in health as a result of Brexit and how we can make sure that we get the best outcomes for patients. And as, as we've already heard, there are some key, uh, key areas in which our health and health systems are in interconnected. And certainly some of those connections have been thrown into sharp relief during the COVID-19 pandemic. So be that importing and exporting medicines and medical devices. Uh, I think that, that we all noticed the, the international nature of imports and exports when we started to look at things like PPE during the pandemic. Um, participating in data sharing platforms and alert systems so we're able to share information and early warnings about uh, various health threats with our nearest neighbours. Participating, of course, fully in research and testing of new treatments, again, have become um, in the headlines around, around the COVID-related things, but that does, of course, extend to all clinical research and testing of new treatments that uh, works in an international way. And as we've heard, uh, recruiting and re retaining the researchers and the clinicians that we need to staff our services. So really, when we think about the NHS and Brexit, then really we need to take a considered approach. Essentially, it's, Brexit is unpicking piece by piece our deep interconnectedness with the EU. And really our role at this moment is to take care to ensure that safeguards are in place to protect patients and um, to stop gaps that emerge. Time is now really short. So really it would seem that the best thing is to reach a deal that includes these safeguards for patients. But things do look different um, because of COVID. We have to recognize this is a bit, of a, a bit of a unique and unexpected context in which it's all happening and not necessarily in a good way, of course. Um, what we're asking the NHS to do at the moment is to prepare for Brexit. 
something that they have had to do in the past, preparing for both deal and no deal, different options, no, no certainty as to what they're going to be facing uh, come the 1st of January. But that's happening this time because um, at the same time as they're having to work really hard to restore services after the first wave of COVID-19. They're having to manage the second wave of COVID-19, which is being incredibly difficult in some places in the country. And preparing for winter that would have been challenging regardless of COVID-19. And when all of those things add together and they're having to be dealt with by healthcare staff who are exhausted, working incredibly hard, we're expecting Brexit to be quite a significant additional burden for them. There's clearly many complex shocks and pressures affecting such a complex system of healthcare delivery at this time. And I think it's very unlikely for that to end anytime soon. We're about to move into this unofficial transition period as the changes, whatever they may be, start to settle or, or phase in. So I think that this is a very timely conversation to be talking not just about the impact of Brexit and COVID on the NHS, but how we can also communicate better with the public and start to look at opportunities for the future of the health service and how the NHS can work best in this interconnected world with these shifting geopolitical matters. Thanks. You're muted, Alison. I am, yes. <laughs> I was just saying the trusts that I cover in the southeast of England are, are all looking again at their Brexit um, preparation plans, obviously for the possibility of, of some sort of no deal and some significant delays crossing the, the channel to Dover, uh, which will have a particular impact on some of the Kent trusts in terms of getting both supplies, staff and patients into um, their, their trusts. So I think that that is suddenly become a very real issue again, which I don't think any of us expected in November last year that we would, that we would still be in the same position a year on. Okay, I'd just like to remind anyone who's watching live that you can um, submit questions uh, for the panel later, which we will turn to in a few minutes. But first, I wanted to hear from Dr. Paul Dara from the, the BMA. What where do you think we are at the moment as we are on the point of le um, ending the transition period and we're battling this second wave of COVID, which I think has come earlier than many of us expected? Um, yeah, maybe I should just introduce myself. I'm Paul Dara. Um, I'm uh, a member of BMA Northern Ireland Council and UK Council, a member of the Board of Science. Um, where are we? Well, as the saying goes, I wouldn't have started from here. Um, we're in a very difficult position um, and when you are in a difficult position what you want to define is where you are with respect to everything else and where the plans and where the paths are laid out for you. Unfortunately that doesn't seem to be taking place. Um, our relationship was to be defined by the Fair Trade Act and also by the European Withdrawal Agreement. And at the moment, we have very little progress being made on uh, the FTA. So we're not exactly sure how that's going to work out. Are we going to have no deal? Or are we going to have a very late deal, Brexit late, um, with a, a minimum of, 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 of cover, but not a great deal of detail? And it's important to know because we need to know to make contingencies because we don't know what contingencies could be made. At the moment, for example, uh, the um, facilities in Larne for transfer of goods are, uh, from the rest of the United Kingdom are not operable. They, they, they won't be ready. So this is of immense import because in Northern Ireland we have particular issues and Bernie's laid out some of them. Um, there was an all island approach to health inequalities, for example, a few years back with a preface by Sir Michael Marmot. And one of the things that identified was the problems, particularly around rural areas, which suffered a great deal during the Troubles and were seen as being on the peripheries of two different um, jurisdictions. A great deal of health inequalities. A great deal of work has been done to address that. A great deal of work remains to be done, but that has been put in jeopardy by, um, 
by Brexit. Like everyone else, I'm concerned, and the BMA is concerned, about particular fields, and they would be the sort of trade and supply of medicines and medical devices, regulation of those medicines and medical devices, the use of data, involvement in research across the, the whole of Europe, and the use of European data, etc. cetera, we're, we're out, out of that. Uh, mutual recognition of, of, of uh, qualifications. In, in Northern Ireland, for example, we have the highest uh, uh, percentage of doctors who qualified in the EU, most of them coming from one single jurisdiction, that would be the Republic of Ireland. I, for example, qualified in the Republic of Ireland, the present chair of BMA, Northern Ireland Complac, qualified in the Republic of Ireland, the previous chair qualified in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so there's been there's been a, a, a great deal of change and transfer there, and that there is uh, there has been recognition, and but the final agreement and the final um, um, list of those people who have been uh, of those um, qualifications which have been recognised have yet to be finally ratified. It won't be until the thirty first of December. Um, there's a concern about the delivery of public service and reciprocal healthcare. There's um, the EU funding and the cross border funding, which Bernie has already referred to. Very very important. And there's also, as, as Bernie also referred to something else, I think, and it's the unintended consequences. Now, I was up at a meeting in Derry in 2018, and it was drawn to my attention about Brexit that a lot of the nurses who work in Alton McGelvin work in Letterkenny. And if there was any, that's in, in Donegal. So if there was any kind of delay in getting across the border, they said it wouldn't be worth their way because of health care, because of child care arrangements and them having to pay for extra hours of child care. For them to consider working and continue to work in Northern Ireland. And as Bernie, uh, Bernie will tell you, the Western Trust has the worst um, level of uh, vacancies within Northern Ireland and the highest depends on locum workers, which is another way of funds being diverted into locums, which are very expensive. And if we, all, if we already had the doctors there and the nurses there, we wouldn't have to engage in this extra expense. So there's, there's, there's an awful lot, and I, I, I see it very, very uncertain. I see it uncertain because of the, and people have alluded to it previously, because of we have a government at the minute which has, um, seems to want to govern without a, on its own, without reference to, to other things. And I'm talking about, for example, if Parliament disagrees with the, the, the government, the government prorogued Parliament, if the Supreme Court then says that that's wrong, the government then seeks ways of trying to limit the powers of the Supreme Court. I'm just worried. Um, I just see that our democracy seems to be fading away, that um, there seems to have been a, a, almost an embracing of, it said it in the, in, in, the, in the film, that there's appeals to emotion rather than facts. Whenever you want to try and get facts out of our prime minister, you get a speech, you get calls to emotion, you get a uh, Churchillian rhetoric, very poor Churchillian rhetoric, by the way. Um, and what we need to put forward first is our health service and our patients and not appealing to quasi-nationalist logic, not quasi-nationalist emotion, which I think it, it, at some stages, this is what it's descending down to. Thank you. Well, it's very interesting. Do, do you think the election of Mr. Biden will make a difference? It may well do. At the moment in Parliament, they are discussing to pass a law whether Parliament can, can actually disregard international agreements, whether you can break an international agreement. I find that incredible that a government can say, we gave our word, but you know what? We're going to break it. If they only really realised how much time, effort, blood went into the Good Friday Agreement, that they can so arbitrarily um, disregard it and not even bring it into consideration at the time uh, when they were thinking of Brexit. It didn't even come into the mental horizon. Joe Biden at least understands the importance of keeping your word. Right. Okay, and last, can we turn to Dr. Paul Williams, who, who was, I think, until 2019, an MP for one of the, the Red Wall seats. I imagine that has given you an interesting perspective on, on, on this debate. 
Yeah, thanks, Alison. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm now back to being a, an NHS doctor. Uh, I'm working today in a, in a COVID clinic, actually. Um, <laughs> after, um, but I spent nearly two and a half years as a Labour MP um, representing a part of the country that had voted to leave the European Union. But of course, um, as, a, as a doctor uh, and, and from a, very much from a political perspective, um, somebody that um, that had wanted to to remain in the EU and, and saw all of the um, the potential harms that leaving the EU would do. I must say, it's been quite a relief not to have been thinking about Brexit every single day um, for <laughs> um, for the last uh, six or nine months. Um, but uh, but it's uh, but it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, where are we? Um, I think we're, we're, we're perhaps in a slightly different place after the um, after the 2019 election. My experience of the 2019 election was that, um, as Paul said, this is this has become something that is just emotional, that isn't that isn't logical. And actually, the the election was really turned into an issue of pride for um, for many many people who had. Um, it, it didn't matter what the consequences of Brexit would be. People had decided that they wanted to leave, and, and and they wanted a government that would that would deliver some kind of leaving. They did. They they stopped listening beyond beyond that conversation, uh, and, and I think that's made it very very difficult for all of us that have tried to appeal to to reason and try to try to develop arguments, because clearly Brexit is only going to do harm to the NHS and to our nation's health. Um, it's going to clearly lead to lower quality healthcare. It's going to lead to more expensive health, and it's probably going to lead to worse health outcomes for for many people. Uh, it, it's a huge, huge challenge for the NHS to have to overcome, even in the best of times. And we all know that we're not in the best of times. And uh, other speakers have really clearly articulated how it's a huge challenge in terms of staffing, in terms of medication. And we've got to think about supplies, uh, including medical devices. It's a particular huge challenge for Northern Ireland. It, it, Brexit makes the money tighter, which is going to put a, a long term strain on the NHS. Philippa mentioned some of the public health uh, Im impacts of um, some of the rulings we have around clean air and clean water but but actually brexit is likely to work to widen health inequalities as well which has a another huge impact on our on our health uh, and of course research and reciprocal health care it it, it it makes it all exceptionally difficult and it just really makes me angry that brexit was clearly not thought through there was there wasn't ever a plan and we have a government that is that is winging it and we're all being forced to wing it now in the nhs just because our prime minister's style is to is to wing it um, watching the film, the, the thing that the thing that struck me most was 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 Anand Medan, uh, who's, who's always very wise about these things. Um, Professor Medan said that this is a bit like a slow puncture, uh, and the changes that we're going to see as a result of Brexit aren't going to hit us overnight, and we may not even notice them for a year or for two years. And we will probably by then even have forgotten where we got the puncture, um, where the origin of those uh, of those problems were. Um, but but it's it, it's almost certain that, um, that that things are going to be very very difficult for us over the next um, over the next couple of years. Um, but of course we are where we are. Uh, the 2019 election did settle the um, the question about whether or not we were going to lead the EU, and all of us now want the very best for our nation's health and for the people that we um, we represent and the people who we, we, we care for. It's going to cost a lot of money to, to mitigate against many of the effects. We're going to, it might cost us more for staff, it'll probably cost us more for medicines, we'll get those medicines later. Uh, it, and where that money comes from is, is, is very difficult to find. Um, but we are going to have to, um, to, to, to as, a, as a health service and as a country, find ways to, um, to, to mitigate the, um, the, the decision that's been made for which there is no good side. Uh, and the final thing I want to say is that I, mean, I think it, it, it is difficult to, to know where, where COVID is taking us in this. 
mix. The, the addition of COVID to the, um, it, it, at this particular time um, will make it very difficult to, um, to untangle. We all have this desire to kind of say, I told you so, and to kind of be able to look back in a few years time and say, well, we told you it was the wrong decision. Why did you do that? But actually the, the fact that the, the NHS and our country and our economy, our economy are so um, badly, have been so badly damaged by um, by COVID, and, and let's face it, the NHS is in a real tangle with, um, with with pathways being redesigned everywhere, with with huge weights and and with huge extra pressures on our system. I, I think it's going to be very difficult to look back and actually say that it was Brexit what done it. Um, it's going to be a combination of Brexit, COVID, and maybe other um, poor political decisions that are, um, that are that are that continue to be made. I think that's very true because obviously we've seen a tremendous hit to the economy in the last few months as a result of COVID and the predictions are that we will see certainly slower growth as a result of Brexit if not an immediate hit and two three years down the line I don't know where we're going to be economically I don't think we'll be where we would want to be and I wonder if people will realise that there is a combined effect from both COVID and Brexit hit, hidden in that. And at the same time, we may be seeing some of the U European nations really beginning to pull ahead of us in terms of economic growth, because I think we have been hit probably the worst um, for COVID and we ha will have some level of Brexit hit to, to our growth rate as well. So I think that could be quite a difficult um, period of time for us. Looking back on the film that you mentioned, which is was made in 2019, and I think was made before um, Mr Johnson became Prime Minister, there's obviously themes in there which uh, still resonate with, with, with us all. Uh, but I wonder if you felt that the future's any more certain um, that, than then, or whether overall we are now looking at, at a, a, a picture that is, if anything, much less certain as a result of the of COVID and the very slow progress on, on Brexit. Just wonder what people felt about that. I'll answer briefly. I think we're less certain now. Um, and of course we, we should be. Remember the whole point of transition was to um, move from one certain state, the state of being within the European Union, to another certain state, which was our future relationship. And we were supposed to have that defined before transition started. Brinkmanship, um, of, um, of, and, it, and it's been a political decision from our government to, um, to, to not make those agreements earlier, because they're, they're, they're terribly, terribly difficult choices that need to be made. Do you wield um, access to European markets, or do you wield power and influence um, and of course our government has been trying to have have their cake and eat it and the European Union quite rightly won't give us both power and influence and uh, and access because they're afraid that we'll undercut them so we are no nearer no closer to knowing um, now um, what this is all going to look like than we were at the time it was made in, in my view. And that uncertainty I imagine is very worrying for the health service it doesn't help. Um, and um, as, as Bernie said, we are all um, focusing on the urgent, uh, a, a perhaps a little too much at the moment. Um, the, there, there aren't big conversations taking place about uh, about Brexit. It's kind of been buried a little bit. Mm. Um, but, but it's certainly, it, it, I, I think December is going to find us talking more and more about the, um, the the, the, particularly the fears of a no deal, bre deal Brexit and but of course from a political point of view the government want, will want to do a deal light um, save us from the brink um, and uh, and then blame everything on Covid. Right. I think um, Paul's point about and, and yours also Alison that in a couple of years it will be very hard to disentangle the impact of Brexit and the impact of Covid I think provides a degree of cover that I am sure will be used politically at that time to say, oh no, it wasn't Brexit, it was COVID. But I think that um, Paul and I will have seen um, when we got the estimates of the economic impact of Brexit, if we had gone for sort of Norway, it was a minus two and a half percent of GDP. If it was a free trade deal, it was like five, six percent drop in growth. And if it was a no deal, it was eight or nine percent. But actually the deal that this 
UK government is asking for is so hard and so thin that actually it's a way up at the high end of a free trade agreement. And therefore the difference between it and no deal is largely about a complete failure of relationships. So the costs of all the customs declarations, paperwork, bureaucracy, delays at borders, the impact on uh, medicines or other things going to Northern Ireland, they're all happening whether there's a deal or not. And, you know, the, they, they kind of keep saying, all we want is Canada. You know, Canada doesn't fish in our waters. Canada doesn't have roll on, roll off ferries where lorries go through, you know, in less than a minute each. So we're not just asking for Canada. And, and the problem is that impact and the costs to the NHS or healthcare are, are kind of going to be there. So I see a bit of a political decision will be made by this government. And, and I think it will be influenced by the fact that it's Biden and not Trump. But you know, if they go for a thin deal, the strongest Brexiteers are unhappy because Europe still has influence over what happens in the UK. If they go, if they go for that deal, people like Paul and I, we're unhappy too because it's so rubbish in comparison to where we were. If they go for no deal, of course we are unhappy but the hardest Brexiteers are rejoicing. So there's a danger that we'll have an ideological political decision that actually this party and this government gain more politically from no deal than the scrawny deal that they're asking for. And the problem for all of us is that the breakdown in discussions, the breakdown in relationship will take ages to, to be repaired. Because it's not like there is no discussion after January. Europe will still be just across the channel. The UK will still depend on the EU for food and medicines coming in, and therefore there will be problems to solve. But there will be a lot of bad temper. And I think for me, that's one of the, the big concerns of a no deal is that breakdown in relationship that makes it harder to organize access to data, to organize, you know, smoothing of medical care or, or anything else is the failure of the relationship. Yes, because we are still going to have to keep, talk to our European partners about a whole range of health related things, I would have thought. And mm. Dr. McKay, do you expect that those will be fairly amicable discussions or do you think that there will be a, an element of us and them going forward, which didn't exist in the past? Well, it's very hard to say, isn't it? Because when you speak to health professionals or research professionals, then there is this very strong desire to collaborate and to find ways to work together to get the best outcomes for patients. But of course, when the discussion goes up to the more political level, quite often those political discussions are not about health. Health is not the primary topic of most of those discussions. So I think that really our concern is that uh, while the health related discussions might have been amicable, actually the decisions will be made on entirely different topics, which may be less amicable and those will have um, impact down to health. So I think that that is a real concern for us. And just um, reflecting on what Paul and Philippa both said around the uncertainty question, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in some ways, we have a little bit more certainty than we previously had. We know that whatever um, deal or non-negotiated deal we end up having, it's going to be towards the fairly, um, fairly harsh side of things mm. um, in terms of collaboration. We do know that. Uh, we know that conversations are going to have to continue after the 1st of January because every single detail is not going to have been confirmed. We know a bit more certainty about the workforce because, of course, that is uh, decisions that are within the UK's gift to, um, to develop in a, in a more unilateral way. And we know a little bit more about what will happen in Northern Ireland because of provisions within the withdrawal agreement. So it is the case that there are some um, areas in which we have a bit of a, a clue as to what's going to happen. Certainly, I would concur with the other speakers that there are many areas that we're right down to the wire. 
we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And that is really concerning for the NHS. And one of the big themes of the, the film was really around how the public saw some of these debates, if they saw that there was a connection between Brexit and the N NHS, and if so, whether that was uh, something that people could be held accountable for, or um, whether this was really um, beyond them. And obviously with COVID, we've seen almost an outpouring of love for the NHS, I feel. People were clap clapping on their doorsteps every Thursday. People were sending pizzas into those working in A&E. There was a general feeling of the country coming together and really appreciating what it had in the NHS. And I think um, and perhaps we've looked at other countries as, uh, as well over this period and seen systems that have not coped particularly well uh, with COVID. Is that going to have an effect? Is that going to make people think a little bit more about some of these questions? I mean, Bernie, you're very close to the ground on this. Do you, yeah. What do you see in Northern yeah. Ireland? <laughs> I suppose people in Northern Ireland, I mean, uh, you know, you have a peace dividend and, you know, people hold dear to their, and I don't want to politicise this, but people hold dear to their heart, you know, the Good Friday Agreement and all that went with it. And there was for a relative period of time where people felt that the economy was growing, that there was a lot of cross-border collaboration and people felt that they were making progress, I would say people are now saying, are we back? Are we going back to square one? That's, that's the thing that is said. Quite often, will we no longer be able to, to avail of the services that are in place? What happens if, for example, one patient said to me quite recently, very, very um, knowledgeable patient, and just go, going back to one of the other speakers, um, the, their point around uh, medicines, uh, would it be possible that I might be discharged from having my radiotherapy um, program, uh, completing my radiotherapy and being given drugs which are actually illegal when across the border? You know, that's a, that's a very strange thing for a patient to have to think about. Yes. So I suppose um, all of our concentration, and then listen very carefully to Dr. Dara, our concentration is about, and, and, and he will agree with me, that, and, and all of you, who it doesn't matter which part of the islands we live in, the further away you are from the seat of government, you know, clearly the, the poorer your access to health care. And these are patients who rely on a service. And, and it's, so, it's so important to them because if you went from North Donegal to Dublin, it's a four or five hour, hour trip to go. So you're away from your family for 68 weeks, whereas now... They're literally across the border, maybe in a half or three quarters of an hour and able to receive that service. So it's really service delivery that people are worried about and they certainly are worried that, that Brexit's going to have an effect. Right. I think in Northern Ireland, it's seeing an effect which is much more direct and much more patient facing uh, potentially than in some of the rest of the country. I just want, wondered, Dr Williams, whether your former constituents um, saw some of the connections here or whether they really were sticking with what, what's almost an emotional support for, for Brexit that can't be swayed by some of the arguments about the impact on the economy and the impact on the health service. Yeah, of course, most people if, don't see for themselves the, the impact on the health service. Um, most people's experience of the health service is actually with their GP or maybe turning up in A&E once every couple of years. Um, uh, and most people don't see the gradual changes in the, the economy. Again, something that's a bit like a, a slow puncture. Um, you know, when I, was, um, when, I when I worked as a doctor, I found that, uh, and, and even now as a doctor, I find that most of the time, most people believe most of the things that I'm saying. But Suddenly, when I became a member of parliament, I found that um, <laughs> I was saying exactly the same things to exactly the same people, but um, but people really didn't believe that they thought that I must have some kind of 
ulterior motive um, just because I was a politician. I think that um, that uh, in a in a in a nutshell sums up what the what the public think about politicians telling them things and 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 and, and, and in many ways their view of sort of logical argument. The Brexit has become emotional, and and the Conservatives um, were, were brilliant at uh, turning that emotional. Uh, almost, almost weaponizing that emotion in the last election, and um, I'll, I'll never forget the look on Matt Hancock's face. And I, I had a reasonably good relationship with Matt. With Matt Hancock, would would chat to him from time to time, took issues to him privately. Um, he'd obviously been to a meeting where they'd invented the slogan "Get Brexit Done," um, and he knew that was a winner, and he knew that that would cut through any kind of rational argument about all the, um, you know, um, whether or not we left the, the European Medicines Agency and Euratom and all of these things, um, get Brexit done. And uh, he knew it and it worked. Um, and, and that's the level that, 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 that unfortunately, most of the uh, most of the people that I represented uh, um, are at and uh, any kind of um, it's it's an emotional gut, gut reaction, and and they will they say that they're willing to live with the consequences. Yes, yes, I think there, there have been various opinion polls showing that people were are quite happy to accept Brexit, even if the consequences a member of their family becomes unemployed. And it's it's quite hard to um, to counter that, I should imagine. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't succeed. So don't ask, don't ask me how to carry it. I lost my seat. OK, I mean, a couple more questions for, for, for d discussion, really. Um, were, were there things within the film, which I, I think you've all seen, which you, you, you disagreed with or you felt that um, perhaps needed to be brought out more? Anyone with? Some thoughts on that? Did did it match your experience? And there's one. Can I may I say what, what one area that I thought was um, um, perhaps um, uh, highlighted by the film, but that that I but that I don't think is a, um, a, a a natural consequence of leaving the European Union, and that's the um, around the increasing privatisation. There, there was there were some discussions around whether or not. Mm in the EU would result in more people having to pay for their health care. Now, um, I do think that this government uh, has uh, a, a lot more faith in the private sector than they do in the public sector. We've seen that with the way that they they went straight to the private sector for, for the test and trace system. That has, and that, sh that, that appears to have been a very poor decision, very expensive um, and not producing very good results and and sidelining a lot of experts, a lot of people who who, who for whom um, the investment in, in local public health teams would have been very welcome, um, but actually, I think that um, if we if we do go to a more a, a system of, of healthcare that is more delivered by private healthcare providers, um, that will be an internal political choice that perhaps could have been made whether we were in the European Union or outside of it. Um, and uh, I, I think that. Our, our choice of government has much more impact on that than our um, that, than we, um, we left the European Union. Um, I think, sorry, if I could just say something. I, I, I think one of the worries was that in case there was a trade deal with America, the part of the part of that would be sub, a, a, an agreement being reached would be subsequent upon um, conditions that the. NHS and healthcare delivery within the United Kingdom would be opened up to American companies much more than previously. Previously, I think there was also uh, there'd been a uh, I can't remember if it was a documentary or kind of a clip on Newsnight or Panorama or whatever, and it was looking at the likely increase in medicine costs if there was a trade deal with America. I mean, yes. Trump has been, uh, and indeed his trade negotiators have been very clear. Um, you won't see NHS or drugs mentioned in any of the trade papers. What it asks for is full and open market access. And what that means is there mustn't be any central procurement. Now, in Scotland, a lot of our machinery, drugs, etc., is all centrally procured, which helped us in COVID, but also saves money. But also, and, and indeed was what the Carter report had proposed for England could save Billions. And the other thing is the like NICE for England and Northern Ireland and the Scottish Medicines Consortium 
who obviously make rulings on the cost effectiveness of drugs. The Americans are utterly against that. Um, they want to negotiate with each individual trust having to purchase at, at market price, and they don't want any kind of central uh, rulings on that. And it was estimated that that could increase drug prices between two and three times. So if you had you know, something like that happening to the drug budget on top of the extra costs of, you know, we import 37 million packets of drugs a month from the EU. So if they all get even a little bit more expensive, that's a lot of hip replacements you're not doing. That's a lot of other things you're not doing because you're paying more um, for drugs. And for us in Scotland, we have a real concern about the UK internal market bill. Obviously what it does to the withdrawal agreement and you know i'm from belfast i grew up in belfast so it, you know it's also important to me what happens to the good friday agreement but also the way it takes uh, devolution apart so uh, you know scotland was the first country in the uk with a smoking ban we are the only one with minimum unit pricing alcohol we have a ban on single-use plastics wales was the first to charge for carrier bags the, the, the internal market bill just removes our right to do that. Um, and the other thing is what was Clause 46, which allows Westminster to spend in devolved areas, means that actually the power over decision making of where we might build a hospital or a clinic or how we service. I mean, Scotland's a third of the UK landmass. And we have 8.2% of the population. We have an enormous country with 70 inhabited islands. So delivering healthcare, broadband, road, rail, anything is enormously challenging. So to suddenly have that those decisions would go back to Westminster, I think we'd probably get something stupid like a Scotland, Northern Ireland bridge, which will have minimal <laughs> economic impact will throw a lot of the old weapons out of the Beaufort Dyke onto the beaches in my constituency, old incendiary devices, and will actually not be a benefit. Whereas that money could be spent on broadband or building infrastructure, both in Northern Ireland and Scotland. It's ridiculous to talk about these kind of decisions going back to Westminster after 20 years of devolution, whether that's from Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland. Thank you. Yes, I, I always felt some of the assumptions that were so being made. So I wonder if I might say. Yes, oh, go ahead, Bernie. Sorry, Sorry Alison. I just, um, it was just, uh, I, I thought maybe the absence of any discussion around the cross border patient mobility directive. Um, and I know uh, certainly both in Northern Ireland and the Republic, and I in the UK as well, people have started to avail very much. Uh, of that directive where they can actually get their, if they're waiting a long time on a waiting list, they can actually get their health care in another European Union country. And I mean, considering the waiting list problem before COVID, you know, and the exponential growth of it during COVID, and, and I suppose for some time to come, you know, nobody's actually saying, can that continue? Will there be any sort of underpinning structure that will allow us to at least do it, do it in a minimal way. So I just think, you know, there's there are very important pieces of legislation and directives that are not even spoken about. And I know they weren't mentioned in the film, but they're not. I just wondered what others thought about that particular directive because it does, you know, people waiting on replacements in Northern Ireland for five years and they can go across the border and get their, okay, they pay for it up front, but they get, reimbursed to the level it would have cost in Northern Ireland. It's, it's a, a big consequence, I think, of the withdrawal. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the impact on future pensioners who want to retire, you know, it's the same reciprocal healthcare system. Um, you know, pensioners mm -hmm. use the S1 system. Yeah. If you're doing it for planned healthcare, whether it's to get a hip replacement done or to have dialysis because you want to travel um, through the S2 system, you know, future in the future, that will not be available to us. You know, the healthcare reciprocity was to support freedom of movement, mm -hmm. not to support people going on a hen night to Prague. 
So the idea that, oh, well, you know, they'll cave in and we'll, we'll, we'll get everything. I don't think we will um, because the system, the underpinning, the legal system around it um, won't be there. And, and all of these, it, also with, with justice, I mean, Ireland really depends on things like the European arrest warrant and the, the data because of the cross-border uh, you know, police and PSNI have raised this as an issue right back to the referendum and it's been ignored. So I think there's probably, we're talking about health, but I think there's probably a lot of specialty areas that never got onto the UK government's agenda and are therefore still not solved with less than 40 working days to go. Right. Okay, we've had, we had a number of questions come in. Um, one for Dr. Whitford in, in particular, how will the UK compensate for the lost connection to the European research network? Well, I'm not sure how they will uh, connect to it. Obviously, a lot of the talk was, well, you know, we contribute into Horizon 2020 and therefore we'll spend that money. But actually, the UK was the number one beneficiary of the Horizon 2020 system. They have already slid down. I think they're fifth in the pecking order at the moment. And the new um, UK Research Institute, certainly for us in Scotland, is an issue because Scotland within the UK punches above its weight. We have, you know, a lot of universities for a relatively small population, but the new research board who will allocate funding does not have any formal representation from the three devolved nations at all. And yet that's who's going to decide where research funding goes to, to universities and research institutes across the UK. The other thing is that about 25 to 30 percent of research staff are European um, yes. a lot of them have been already drifting away. So, you know, much as there's a lot of um, jingoism in the chamber, in the House of Commons about world beating, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think, unfortunately, the UK is a leader in a lot of sectors, but I think that will drift. And for those of us who are in the devolved nations, but with really, uh, you know, internationally renowned research centers, there is real concern about staffing and about funding. Yes, I, I've certainly heard of whole teams of people going off to German universities because the, the, yeah. the principal investigator or whatever has been offered a professorship there and has taken the team with, with them. Um, I guess, that, again, that's something which is quite hard for the public to grasp at this point. They perhaps don't see the downside side of that. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're losing good people, people who would have done research here, would have built, built up teams here, but also is that likely to have an impact on future health services? Well, obviously, you know, there's the new uh, kind of streamlined clinical, clinical trial system for the EU, which is a lot less bureaucratic and allows you to register a trial, register patients, share data in a much better way than its forerunner. And the UK is going to be kind of on the outside of that. And, and it isn't just EU researchers leaving. Some of my colleagues from when I was in the NHS who were principal investigators of, of projects they had originally designed were being asked to step aside. They could collaborate on a project, but they could no, no longer be the principal investigator on a project that was funded with, with EU money. So we will actually lose some of our indigenous kind of renowned uh, researchers as well. But I, I think like all the other things we've talked about, I mean, the public have a greater awareness of the NHS. They will uh, interact with that more than they interact with research. So it'll be very hard for them to realize, you know, Research feeds into the pharmaceutical industry. It also feeds into work that is done in the NHS and our access to innovative drugs during the research phase. So it, it will inevitably have an impact on retaining senior people who are academic and research orientated within the NHS. Is there much we can do to stop that sort of brain drain? I think probably the only thing would be for the UK government to ensure that they did at least fund uh, research to a high level, to the same level as uh, we were receiving from the EU. 
to make it much easier for uh, Europeans and indeed others to come here. Um, and, and it's not just a matter of what kind of visa. I mean, the drop in EU nurses over the last four years, they've been allowed to come, but they haven't felt welcome. So they have chosen not to come. So, you know, setting up immigration barriers and then going, oh, but you're special, we'll let you in, and we may or may not let your family in, you know, all of those things just create uh, an atmosphere of people not feeling welcome and they make a decision, I'm not going to move my family there. So the so funding is one thing, but the, the narrative from the Home Office and the government around immigration uh, and the kind of xenophobia leading up to the, the, the referendum and since does not is not attractive to, to people outside. I mean, my husband's been a doctor here for since 1986 and he's still in limbo waiting to hear the answer to his EU settled status. He wow. should be fine, but you know, that, that is still a thing that is distressing after working as a GP for all these years to be waiting to hear if you've got permission to go on living where you've lived for all of that time. And, and, and that makes people who are not here think, nah, not going to do that. I've heard that from many people in the NHS that the, the settled status application is tremendously time consuming. And even if the, they get that, if they then want to become uh, UK nationals, there's a considerable cost uh, uh, attached. I mean, far more than a, a, a nurse or a physiotherapist could easily meet. So I think that, that's a big issue going forward. There is, but the other big issue, Alison, is that on average, about 40% of applicants in any month are only being given pre-settled status. Yes. That's particularly yeah. impacting on those with caring responsibilities and therefore career breaks, i.e., impacting more on women. And one of the big things, if you've only got pre-settled status, you can only leave the, the UK for six months. You don't have the protected five years that you have with settled status. And I have constituents who've been here for decades and are yet being given only pre-settled status. So it's not working the way it was described. It's not doing what it said on the tin. Okay, um, another question for, from people viewing. Um, which is really directed to those of you who are working within the NHS, and they're asking what levels of trust and confidence um, in government are like within the NHS um, and amongst um, both those working for it, um, clinical staff, managers and so forth, and amongst patients. And what could make that improve? That's quite a big question. <laughs> Would one of the Dr. Pauls like to, to, to answer that? I think um, confidence comes with certainty. And uh, what we need is to know with a bit more certainty how things are going to play out. And that is not going to happen for a while yet. And we're all, of course, already playing this on a background of people who are not feeling particularly um, confident in how COVID has perhaps been managed by certain sectors, maybe not the NHS, who they, I think most people think is doing a wonderful job, but maybe um, certain aspects uh, of uh, how it's been managed, such as track and trace, how the government's handling it, how lockdown is being applied, etc. The, um, the, the truth, is, as I see it, is that the NHS, there are a wide number of people that work for the NHS and, and actually... Yeah. You can find it, the NHS in many ways represents society as a whole. Um, and so you will always, um, uh, like, like many of us in our personal lives, we, um, we, we, we tend to have these conversations with people in a, in a slight echo chamber. Um, and I find many, many people coming to me um, saying what, what a bad idea they thought Brexit was and how um, they, they have a real lack of confidence in the, in, in the government. But, but actually, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that um, both from a, from a staff point of view and a patient point of view, there's a, there's a, there's a wide range of views. Perhaps a, perhaps a slight tendency towards um, uh, a, 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 a kind of remain and, you know, I wish we'd stayed in the EU position, but, um, but, but, a, a, but probably a stronger um, 
emotional connection towards the NHS than to the European Union. Um, and, and therefore, there's, there's possibly a bit of moving on uh, and people, uh, a bit of people, you know, you can move through the different phases of grief. Uh, and, it, and it feels to me as though there is now an acceptance in the NHS uh, and a desire to, um, to, make, to make, perhaps to make the best out of a bad, a bad situation. I think that hearing from NHS managers who are members of NHS Confederation, uh, really the focus now is on what needs to be done. Um, it, it feels like the conversation has moved on beyond should we, shouldn't we, because in fact it is happening. And really the conversation is when are we going to get the certainty that we need to do some really good planning on yeah. this? And when that certainty is there, then that is where confidence can grow if that certainty doesn't come till the zero hour, then that is going to be challenging to feel confident about. And in Scotland, we've, uh, you know, health is devolved. So a lot of the NHS management is under the Scottish government. And of course, the majority of people in Scotland did vote remain. So, uh, and, and that would be reflected and I, I would say probably amplified among NHS staff who I think are more aware of, um, the, the impact of Brexit and the fear that it, that of how it's going to go. Um, I think also there's a kind of feeling of loss of agency here in that the Scottish government and therefore through them, the NHS in Scotland is not consulted, has no voice in Brexit at all. Uh, there's very little consultation and I'm sure that's the same for Northern Ireland as well. Um, and, and therefore there, there's just, quite a feeling of being done to um, instead of, you know, I, so I, I don't sense great acceptance or, or moving on here. I think, you know, the public in general here are very anti-Brexit. That has got stronger since the referendum. I think that would be higher in the NHS, although I've never seen a survey, but that would be my impression. And there's just this feeling of uh, someone very distant is making these decisions refusing to consult you and refusing even to make relatively minor um, kind of discussions that would allow you to plan. So even around the things like radioisotopes, medicines, etc., it's very difficult for the Scottish government to, to be included um, in discussions or to, to prepare themselves. So, you know, there's a real sense of um, abuse and loss of agency, which I think adds into it here in Scotland. Yes, I think um, the lack of certainty is one of the issues around damage uh, limitation at the moment. Yeah. Um, and to, until we get some certainty, it's very hard to do some of that. Um, I think from my experience talking to NHS staff, we went into the, the COVID period with a feeling that the government had acted rather late and almost immediately were hit by considerable shortages of PPE. So I think there was an enormous loss of confidence at that stage. Um, but things did seem to improve over the summer. And at least now, as we hit the second wave, people don't seem to have the same immediate concerns around things like PPE. Though I think there is a, a more general concern about how well the NHS will be able to cope going, going forward, as we've seen in the last week or so, some quite significant cancellations of elective work, um, certainly in the North, increasingly in the Midlands as well. Okay, a um, couple of last questions. One is actually to me um, asking about the impact locally um, of Brexit and about who's responsible for updating Brexit contingency plans locally. I think the answer is that there is an overall forum called the Kent Resilience Forum, which includes representatives from a large number of uh, public sector bodies that has an, an overarching plan. Uh, but within the NHS, it is, I think, each individual um, trust has its own plans um, for how to deal with this, I'm sure, um, GP practices, particularly down on the south coast, probably have those as well. Is that the case, um, Dr. McKay? Uh, yeah, there's local resilience forums all, all, over, all over the place who are making those decisions. Okay. 
And then we've got a, a couple of comments. One's from Jonathan Harris saying the economic hit from Brexit has been £200 billion pounds, uh, mm. less GDP growth just since the start of 2016. So really since we had the referendum. Um, the projections going forward are for 60 to 70 billion pounds additional hit to growth per year. Um, there's not that much difference between a no deal Brexit and a, a, and a deal in that. And the 200 billion pound figure is based on Bank of England calculations in 2018. And which means that the cost since 2016 has been more than all UK EU contributions over the um, 47 years that we've been a member. And also from Professor Tamara Harvey in relation to, to this discussion around untangling the effects of Brexit and COVID-19 on the NHS. Um, Tamara is from the University of Sheffield and she says, we're doing some work with the Health Foundation and the Nuffield Trust to try and track the effects of Brexit and future trade arrangements and other agreements. Um, On, on migration and health and hope to be able to provide some measure of untangling. And the Health Foundation has commissioned a pilot project looking at what data we already gather and would need to gather in order to track the effects of trade relationships on health going forward. And that would be across all four um, nations of, of the UK and hopefully managing to separate out some of the, the differences which we're obviously seeing in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And that will report by the end of the year and um, will potentially go forward. Which, I mean, that certainly sounds like a very interesting pro project. Um, and a final question now from Jonathan Harris. What impact will the huge economic costs on the UK economy plus government um, spending on COVID, which is already more than I think 200 billion and is likely to be considerably more given the uh, announcements last week about the um, furlough schemes have on future U NHS funding. I think that's going to be a key question going forward because mm. I can't see how the, uh, the country can really afford all of this unless we roll over the debt that we're going to accumulate for a generation or so, and we actually view COVID-19 as a once in generation or even a once in a century event that therefore should be paid for over the same period. But I wondered what people felt this would mean for the NHS and its budget. Well, I'm no economist, but I think that it puts us in a very challenging situation because we've seen now the absolute imperative of investing in the health service. We've seen the impact of having vacancies. We've seen the impact of working uh, with such little additional capacity. Then it's incredibly challenging when um, something unexpectedly comes along that requires additional capacity. So we're certainly in a situation here where the NHS is going to need the funding to deliver uh, to deliver a service for now and a service for the future, bearing in mind the things that we have learned in COVID-19. And um, I certainly don't have the answers, but this is a real challenge. And I think it would be it would be a grave mistake to look away from investing in the health service at this particular moment in time. Would people agree that um, this, this does look like um, a significant challenge to NHS funding? Um, bearing in mind that we've still got the funding for um, COVID vaccines, which are likely to be needed every year, um, yeah. plus coping with, with long COVID, which could mean that there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who are going to need some level of support for months, if not years. I think long COVID will put a big pressure on the NHS, and obviously it has taken us quite a while to recognize the impact of that, particularly on younger and middle-aged patients, whereas there was a kind of, um, oh, well, it doesn't affect them kind of narrative going around. But I mean, the, the, the UK debt is now um, over 2 trillion, but about half of that, the kind of four or 500 
uh, billion from the banking crash and the four or 500 billion from this are both quantitative easing. So this was the Bank of England, in essence, printing money rather and, and buying up government bonds rather than, you know, borrowing from the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or, or somebody else. So, um, you know, quite a lot of it is wrapped up in the Bank of England. But while many people in the current government have claimed, oh, the good thing was our finances were in good condition when we were hit by COVID, that's complete nonsense. Because at the end of 10 years of austerity, what we saw was that the NHS and particularly social care had been cut to the bone, as Leila said, you know, huge number of, of vacancies. And if, if the answer to this was seen as another decade of austerity, you will literally pull that apart. And then on top of that, you've, we're going to have that GDP loss of Brexit, which you know is, is, is going to increase. So the answer to this can't be just another big impact of austerity. I would hope that we would realize that defense from a national point of view is not you know, investing more in nuclear weapons. It's about national resilience. So, you know, if you look back to 2015, the strategic review put um, cyber attack, terrorism and flooding were the top three, not being invaded by Russia. What we need to add to that is the recognition that on this occasion, it's a virus that has brought our entire economy and society to a shuddering halt. So resilience, both social resilience and uh, health and social care resilience should be seen as part of your security, defence and resilience. And as well as the impact of austerity on health and social care was the impact of austerity on people. You know, Paul referred to the health inequalities, the poverty, you know, the, the impact of COVID has not been equal and has hit poorer communities and poorer individuals much harder. And they are still struggling from week to week and we still have people who eight months on have had no financial support whatsoever the the so-called excluded three million people so you know if we take the same approach as to the banking crash then in 10 years time we're going to be in a very much worse situation than we are now that option really cannot be there and my worry is the narrative from the chancellor kind of sounds as if that might be where they're going and that that gives me great concern. Okay. Right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, it's now um, just over um, 20 past one. So I think we will have to, to wrap it up then. But thank you very much indeed to everyone on the panel and also to those viewing. Thank you. Thank you.